Hey guys and welcome to Canaman TV. My name is Conor McLeod and this is part 3 of episode 56 where I interview Angus from Real Seed Company. Make sure and like and subscribe and I hope you enjoy it. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I, apologies Angus if it comes across some fucking like no making sense. I just got this thing in my mind. I'm trying to I, like, you know, it's it's like there's there's I don't know if it's just a stage I'm at in my life or if this is going to be an ongoing thing one time. I mean, when I was younger, I had the same thing of like, you would, I'd be like nine, ten years old and be like, what the fuck, what is this? Like, what's the moon day? And, and all that kind of like analysis thing. And just as I as I, as I get older, it's like, I don't know if there's, I mean, what's your, what's your, I think that's what it is. I don't even have a, I, I wouldn't say I have a particular, this is not really related to cannabis in any way, shape or form, but like any particular <laughs> belief system or like, I don't have, I'm not, I wouldn't regard myself as religious um, uh, or uh, that kind of thing, but it's just an inquiry, you know, It's because it's, it's, I'm, I'm being honest as well, I'm actually in the process of just finishing up um, Francis Collins' book, The uh, the God Language, I think that's what it's called. Um, and that's he, bad, I, I think that's, I'm fucking butchering the title here, I'm actually almost to be finished it as well. But that's, he's a, he's a, um, he's a scientist to the core, you know, he was the, the head of the, the Human Genome Project, stood with Bill Clinton in 1999, all this kind of stuff, but he's also a Christian. And, um right. And and so he tries to, and his book is all about that, about how you can be a scientist whilst also having faith. Um, and I, I think that's yeah. even, even the use of faith, the, the, the term faith, I don't know, it's just language is very, um, you can be very reactionary to it. But I don't know, it's just that, it's, that there's just, it's that inquiry. I mean, what is your personal belief in life? Do you, do you hold a philosophy or are you just on a pursuit of continuous understanding? I mean... In, look, I mean, in, so you can tell, I mean, I, from the way I'm talking, I mean, my background academically, I was going to do science, but I did, um, I ended up doing a literature degree and then I went on and did a master's degree in Buddhism and that type of stuff. Right. The, the thing is, I don't, I think we, I think basically, I don't find that my attitude to these things fits neatly into any of the available kind of categories, you know? Right. So, what I mean, what I do if I take an interest in something like the Nat and uh, World and the Anandakanda and these types of things is I approach it on its own terms and I try as far as I'm able to to understand it on its own terms and not try and fit it into preordained categories that I've got about what it is, you know? Right, right. So, because that's the, that's just how you can get as close as possible to what it is that you're being told about, you know. Yeah. Is yeah. to drop as many of your preconceptions as you can. You know? mm. So if I'm if I'm interested in uh, what they're saying in their meditation practices, uh, for me anyway, because I've come from a kind of interest in background in Buddhism, I'm already familiar with those kinds of practices in any way, just from tinkering around with that kind of stuff myself, you know. Mm. So I can kind of translate it into that um in that way uh in terms of like uh, what you're saying in terms of sort of belief systems i mean you know, i've spent a lot of time engaging with stuff like that so that's often a lens through which i see the world you, you can think of it like putting on a pair of glasses you know yeah you put on a pair of buddhist glasses you can look at the world that way i don't find it's that difficult to make that harmonize with a scientific pair of glasses you can wear them both at the same time and things still make sense i would argue you know yeah. some people would say no you're just there's just two different ways of seeing the things but most Buddhists aren't like that. If you go, you know, so during the middle of all this coronavirus stuff, uh, they're all getting vaccinated in the monasteries because they saw what happened when they weren't and it just wiped everyone out. Most of them respect scientific thinking, um, you know, uh, and uh, what, you know, like I said, they've watched it all spread like wildfire through that. Most of Tibetans who also do all these tantric practices and householder Tibetans and Tibetan doctors who practice the traditional medicine, most of them also like are totally uh, into science, you know. Mm. They don't see these things as two different options. They see them as complementary things. Mm. And many traditional Tibetans who are really into, when I was collecting up in the Humla, like very remote bits of Nepal, which are a lot of uh, people there are Tibetans, um, or, or following Tibet uh, for sort of ethnically connected groups, you know. Um, they 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 will totally respect the lamas that they follow. They'll take it very, very seriously. They'll be practicing, just walking around saying mantras all the time. But if they want to go to the doctor, if they're sick, they'll go to the Western doctor because they don't think the Tibetan doctors are very good sometimes. You know? Right. Some yeah. stuff. You know? So I, I don't, I mean, the, you know, the Dalai Lama's like that. He, he's he's um, in, uh, 
he's he he thinks Tibetan doctors are great as well, but he uh, so not like that. But I mean, he he sees the science and stuff as compatible. That that it's just in a sense of like a deepening of the alchemical understanding of the of the, of the world. It's about the material world. It's really good at stuff like that, yeah. but it's not very good on the uh, mind, you know, in the consciousness. Let's forget about like spiritual. It's just like the mind. It doesn't understand that very well, you know. Mm. And uh, you know, and um, I, I broadly speaking agree with him on that. You know, mm. and and I would say if you're trying to understand the mind, Buddhism is about as good as it gets in terms of if you want to really analyze and stuff. Uh, I would say it's because it's like. You know, some types of Westerners who get into these types of things, like, uh, there was the original pure Buddhism and then all this like tantric stuff that the Dalai Lama does is this kind of late corrupted form of Buddhism. I think that's a very foolish way of looking at it. Um, because, okay, just to be clear what I'm saying there, there was like the Buddha in like 400 BC or so. And then there's the type of Buddhism that went to Tibet, which is like more than a thousand years after that. Right? <laughs> and they would say, oh, it's got corrupted over that time. I would say bullshit, man. It's just, it's like, it just took on board a lot of other stuff that was going on, like yeah. with the fowlers and stuff. It borrowed techniques from them. It was Developed like, over time. Is, I like a bit of this. Like, this works. This doesn't work. Just yeah. took all the good stuff, combined it all together. It all fits together pretty fucking neatly. And, and then you've got a whole range of options of techniques that they can use for, for, for various things. And, you know, I mean, I'm talking to these uh, Nat guys in, in, in the Kathmandu Valley. And uh, at the same time, like, uh, they had friends who were, um, uh, you know, these kind of dreadlocked lamas from the Tibetan traditions. And they're all sitting down, like, in English, kind of arguing about the different stuff they can do. And there was an element of, none of these guys were very senior figures, you know. There was an element of kind of, like, uh, competitiveness, you know. Right. Ah, I've got this technique. It's like having a... We call it like a universal orgasm. It's like having an orgasm the size of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, oh, we have something much better than that. And, and, and it, it's like, because, you know, these are like traditions that are not like very, um, they are ascetic in a sense, but they're not like world denying, you know, in, in another way, you know. Yeah. It's not, you know, like I say, there is Western teachers, I forget his name. One of them has written a bit about cannabis, an American guy. And he's saying, you know, this is, as he sees it, this is about effectively using your body as a vehicle, just as a, I'm, I'm giving a very bad uh, synopsis, of it, but, you know, it's a pleasure machine, you know, yeah, yeah. you can generate stents, states of intense bliss. You can learn how to do it. You can learn how to reproduce it and do it again. You know, it's repeatable in that sense. It, it's, in, it's an interior state. It may correlate with like flooding and rushing of hormones and mm. waves of serotonin or whatever. I don't know, you know, but, um, some people want to, you know, analyze it and find out that aspect. But ultimately, what's that going to give you? I don't know. You can say, oh yeah, so serotonin's doing this, and uh, the this, uh, you know, neurons doing that. It, okay, you know, great. It's uh, <laughs> that, that, that has a, that has some value, I guess, yeah. course, for further studying, further understanding how the brain works and stuff. But it's relatively not significant to just being able to do stuff like that, which makes a transformational difference to one's life you know yeah so these llamas are sitting and learning to do that and uh and they're looking at the rest of us like chasing around after like you know this career and that status and thinking what the fuck is wrong with you guys <laughs> you <know? laughs> what do you think you're gonna go with this what what where, yeah. where, you, you're going you're running you're running fast and you're going nowhere you know? yeah why not yeah. just learn how to go nowhere and realize that there's exquisite pleasure to be had in that you know yeah, yeah. in, in it, it, it's it's uh I'll be honest. The, 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 sorry to interrupt. The, the ever in, ever encroaching presence of technology. I know it's been around for a while, but I often catch myself fantasizing about a fucking house in the middle of nowhere. You know, trees around everywhere, a fucking lock in the front, something like that. Just because it just feels more and more like I don't know. It's yeah, mostly, yeah. It's, it's very important. Why not? Feeling. I mean, this is the thing. Uh, again, you know, uh, Westerners in Asia, who, who you know, because people listening to this who might want to go and like wander around Asia. Be very wary of kind of judging what you see because there's nothing wrong with wanting wanting these things and having these things per se. You know, mm, mm. it's it's just to simply to get lost in them and lost in the desire for them that that, that would be seen as foolish. You know, so yeah. they'll be you're asking about magic and power and stuff. There are people who go and pray to like you know um, Jambala and stuff. These different tantric deities who are 
who was meant to be very good for giving you stuff that you want. I mean, I don't know if there's any truth in that, yeah. but you know, th that's perfectly legitimate uh, Buddhist activity, for example, you know, and to sort of judge that as being a debased or degraded form of it is, is actually just to misunderstand what you're looking at. So there's nothing wrong with wanting these things from, I'm just saying from the perspective of what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, right. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, it's just to be unskillful would be the, would be the judge the, the, the judgment about it's how you go about it you know yeah you're just like r grasping and attached and relentlessly uh if, if your happiness depends upon it mm -hmm. you know then you're fucked you know yeah. it, it, it's uh, like uh, there's the famous guy um because we're talking about this uh, Dujan Rinpoche who would always quote this line from um uh well uh, uh, Shanti Deva I think anyway it's like Either you can cover the world in leather or you can put on a pair of shoes, you know? Right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's um, much better to put on a pair of shoes. It makes a lot yeah. more sense. But West yeah. Westerners were pretty busy covering the world in leather and it's fucking up really big time now, you know? And uh, I can link that back to cannabis, incidentally. So he's always... Um, Shanti Deva always talks about like uh, being like a block of wood, which is a slightly weird image for what you what a Buddhist would want to do. Yeah. But um, because you're not meant to be like dead and impassive, you know. But he would say, in in the sense, of, insofar as how you relate, to sort of like wanting to be this, wanting to have that, wanting to achieve this, wanting to have that, better to be like a block of wood in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. So a block of wood, I'm I'm pretty sure in that Shanti Deva context is how, what the name Kalanda comes from. And the Kalandas were the big cannabis guys who spread cannabis all out of Central Asia to India and the Middle East and stuff. Yeah. They were Muslims, but they were coming out from this Persianate background that was, they'd spent like hundreds of years like rubbing up against uh, Buddhist traditions. And a lot of the language they used to talk about themselves was derived from that. You know? So these guys were ascetics who thought that we were all mad and they just used to go and hang out in the middle of the market in the street just bombed out of their heads on cannabis, <laughs> just like waving their cocks around at people and leering at them. And, <laughs> like leaving high street, you know? <laughs> and, and they were like, we've already found God. You guys are lost and you're disgusting creatures and we're just showing you yourselves, you know? Mm. Um, and, and I think they're, they're pretty cool. I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> you showed them the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Anyway. To drag, to drag that painfully back from uh, Buddhism to cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just that's, 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 that's funny, man. But but now, I mean, so cannabis-wise, what's your attention focused on at the moment? Um, uh, uh, I mean, basically, like trying to persuade people to do this gene bank thing, and then uh, when I'm in summertime, I'm sort of uh, it's a useless time to be collecting seeds, so I'm just sat um, reading and researching and, and, and writing stuff, and then uh trying to get lots of good photos of things to do uh to go in the book and things like that you know have you got a timeline do you think the book will, will end the next year or something or longer uh i've been talking about it for years as anyone knows who pays atten any attention to what i'm doing so i don't know is it I, I i've at some point it will get to a point where i'm kind of satisfied with it that it's what i'd want to read right. and it's not it's not there yet you know so mm -hmm. <laughs> it's probably never going to happen, you know. Yeah, no, I didn't say by, that, man. No, honestly, it, 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 it'd be great to honestly once get it done, Angus, because there'll be loads of people that will want to read that, me included. Yeah, it's just it's a it's a pretty secondary significance in terms of getting this the collecting done and and, and getting all that organised and this, the seed stuff is of much more consequence long term. So, yeah. but yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, I'm I'm keen for it to get published myself. It's just uh, I don't always enjoy writing, you know. No. Sometimes I really enjoy it, but it, other times I don't. I find I'll it. I'll be honest, it doesn't come across in any of your work. Any of the stuff that's on the website, it seems to be, it's, it's all very obviously fluent and it's impassioned. Yeah, yeah, but it's the thing, but it's, um, it, that's more stuff that's on the, on the stuff on the blog and stuff like you're reading about that Turkish sea stuff. I write stuff like that when I've just got so fucking pissed off about <laughs> something I've been paying attention to. Uh, you know, in spite of myself, I've been paying attention to it. I think it's basically like my to, to for my background. If some people might wonder, like, why am I occasionally like, why is he occasionally posting this kind of like obviously political stuff? For one thing, I think cannabis is inherently political, not inherently, but it's unavoidably political. Yeah, because it's been politicized so relentlessly, mm -hmm. relentlessly. Sorry, and 
the other thing is is that you know the, the background of the guys i grew up smoking with like who grew up with me in wales and stuff like they were all from my sort of crew of people i used to get stoned with as a, as a teenager and a student and stuff they were all very political people you know like much more than me right. they all wanted to go to like russia and ukraine and stuff i was like oh fucking what is wrong with you why the fuck would you want to go there <laughs> I want to go to India, I want to go to Indonesia and Pakistan and Afghanistan and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. And, and, and you know, take drugs and get enlightened and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and they're like, oh, it's all bullshit. You're a twat. We should make a difference to the world and do something useful with your life, you know? So they all went off to become journalists in Russia and Ukraine. I went off to, like, India and stuff, and we all ended up, like, deeply depressed by what, <laughs> what we discovered. But... That, so that I'm always following friends of mine, what, what they're up to, and they're mostly writing about, you know, I, I went to Ukraine as well around the, in the 90s, and, and, and like, you know, so I've been watching, like, places I know get, like, fucking turned into, like, a fucking mor a mortuary abattoir kind of situation, you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know, so sometimes I just fucking, I just have enough, and I, and, I, and I know that a lot of people who are into weed, they've kind of tuned all that out. So the, the problem with tuning the world out is you become very easy to manipulate, you know, because yeah. you don't fucking know what's going on. Yeah. And, and the difference is, is that I do know people who do know what's going on because they really care about it and have been getting into it and know people from these places. And now and then I kind of like, oh, fuck, I just put something up on there because it's my website. I can do what I fucking, yeah, <laughs> I can do what I fucking want. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, so occasionally I'll sort of put um, uh, political things on there about Ukraine and stuff, you know, or China, you know, because I like I, I spent a lot of time in Taiwan and I know that Taiwan has got a fairly high chance of ending up like Ukraine, but it'll be even fucking worse, you know. Right. And it's a nice place, full of nice people, and it's a lovely, it's a, just a lovely country for it's like Ukraine was, you know. Yeah. Difference being, Taiwan is a you know a long way ahead of where Ukraine was in terms of Ukraine had huge problems with like. Uh, you know, corruption because of being next door to Russia, you know. But mm. Taiwan is a lovely place and it's quite likely to end up like kind of Xinjiang, which is basically a massive fucking prison, you know. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I'm partly part of my, uh, my part of my time, my attention's on stuff like that, you know, just because mm. I know people there and I'm, I, I worry about it, you know. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, so now and then I, I kind of do stuff like that. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, uh, to be honest, I'm... When it comes to politics, it's really frustrating because there's an <clears throat> there's an advert um, that pops into my head, a cartoon, funnily enough, and that's what like because I don't really take it's not that I don't take an interest, it's that it becomes exhaustive. Like pol politics yeah, is exhausting; yeah. it really is exhausting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but there's an advert that's stuck in my brain. Um, and I must have been about eleven or twelve or something when I came on TV, and all it was was there was a guy. This this really it was black and white. It's cartoon, and the guy's sitting at the bar, and and the the barmaid is like all right that's last rounds turn and he's like what that's ridiculous the last rounds already and then his mates are next to him hey mate shut the fuck up you don't you didn't vote and that's what it was it was like you know you didn't you don't have an you don't have an impact or a, or a voice related yeah, to politics yeah. so you can't talk about the consequences of it and that's how i feel i feel like i don't engage so i should just shut the fuck up and... <laughs> yeah well i mean it's not it's not shut the fuck up it's like uh, but i you see, when I'm when I'm we haven't really gone into the, the 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 kind of revolutionary side of cannabis. We haven't really gone into that. We've been talking more about things that in the West we tend to partition off into a different zone of sort of spiritual interior, meditative, spiritual stuff. Yeah. yeah but yeah. I mean, these are not two separate categories in terms of the history of cannabis. You know. So I guess what I would say is like, for me, my my interest when I look more at the history of it, more and more I go deeper into it, into these traditions and stuff. The, particularly the Central Asian, Persian, Muslim side of it. it. It was all revolutionary. It was all about like these kind of Robin Hood brotherhoods of Ayaris and Javan Mahdi and Futura and stuff. These are all just words I'm throwing out, but they were different. They were like, they were often craft associations. People who worked in certain types of uh, crafts would have a, a guild or a brotherhood. Sometimes they were ascetic, so they'd sometimes be celibate, not necessarily... But they'd, they'd, be, they'd all be, you know, the drug they would be taking would be, would be cannabis. They'd hang out and they'd discuss stuff in groups while taking cannabis. It would be spiritual. There'd be mystical aspects to it. But they were all uh, warrior groups, you know. So they, these were all martial groups. They'd all know how to fight. And when it would be kind of, uh, they, they would often be the source of revolutions, you know. So if you had a bad king or, uh, you know, despotic kind of oppressive uh, uh, regime was in charge of places, 
mm-hmm. that they would over they would always be the source of the revolutions that overthrew these things you know so that that's what i'm kind of getting interested in now so uh, today i was kind of trying to get back into the 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 the, the, the sensometer side of it but the Central Asian roots of it, and the reason why it became illegal, so uh, it got banned so many times, a long time before the West, you know, was because it was so closely associated with these kind of, uh, you know, uprisings that happened out of these kind of mystical warrior brotherhoods, you know. Right. Uh, anyway, I mean, that's a whole other fucking podcast that we. <laughs> no, I mean, I definitely I'll have that. to get you on the channel again, Angus. This is dynamite, man. But it's quite interesting. Just essentially, before we wrap up, is that that uh, the 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 similarity between the the uprising and obviously the, the the preceding relatively undesirable groups using cannabis obviously for revolutionary means or, or, or as a consequence of it whatever preceding it then you fast forward and then you've got the 60s and 70s and it's associated with the exact same dynamic yeah yeah but you see i think one of the reasons where we went wrong was the in the in the i mean i'm being very honest here now it's but like <laughs> yeah. i probably listen to myself talking later and go like oh. But the thing is, <laughs> where, where they kind of went a little bit wrong, in my opinion, in terms of their understanding of it in the 60s, was that because they were, it was anti-war, understandably anti-Vietnam and this horrific shit that was happening in Vietnam, they missed out on the, the, the an aspect of what the, in, of the cultures, which was, you know, there is this sort of warrior tradition, all these sadhus that like Allen Ginsberg and people were sort of sitting, smoking with in India. He saw, he saw one side of it, but what he didn't get was that these were, these Akaras and stuff, these were like, you know, they were they were uh, warrior bands, you know, by origin and by nature. You know, that's what they were doing. So, and um, they weren't necessarily good, necessarily. You know, mm-hmm. they fought for they, they they were these were guys like Anup Guruga Sain who who they were ultimately they were like kind of warlords, you know, because they had like an army of twenty thousand people under them once they got really powerful, you know. But by origin, they were generally a sort of a kind of like a more romantic thing actually you know in places yeah. like afghanistan and uzbekistan and persia and turkey and stuff well turkey uh, turkey originally comes really from this sort of kind of duration these wandering uh kind of vagabond robin robin hood would be the closest we've got in the west to these kind of what these groups were uh, idealistic often very idealistic very high principles you know you had to live up to the the code you know and if you didn't that was like you were out you know yeah, but then they could obviously be very easily corrupted, you know. And people who didn't like them would all portray them as a bunch of like robbers, brigands, often like homosexuals. You know, they were accused mm-hmm. of being like groups of, of, of like, basically just of a, for for fucking and taking drugs. You know, yeah, the but, others, it, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I mean, each to their own and stuff. But also, but you yeah. know, it's very easy to like because a lot of what's written about them is written by people who didn't like them. You know? Yeah. But they were a source of revolutions all across places like Afghanistan, you know, and and there are a reason why those re- those areas have never been easy to control, you know, because that was a strong part of their culture. And of course, it's all being crushed in like Central Asian dictatorships that come out of the former Soviet Union, like Uzbekistan and stuff, and in Turkey, they wiped all out all of that out, you know, mm. all of those that kind of tradition. And, and making cannabis illegal was a big part of how they did that. Honestly, I've got this image in my mind of revolutionary groups on the horizon and there's like a panic <laughs> fucking waving in the wind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's what, if you look into it, it's what it's all about, you know. So, in touch with that, because I'm so fucking disillusioned by all the kind of corporatization of it, even though that's a big part of the history of it as well, you know. But the idealistic kind of revolutionary side of it, it's all been missed out and you don't get any of it in the books that have been written so far, you know. So if there are other people listening to us who are doing that, it's, you've really got to get that into it. You don't you can't understand it if you don't see that, you know? Because it's like us sitting here now, you know. Mm-hmm. If you're stoned, if doing this kind of thing, you know, you get all this flood of ideas. You can often sound like you're not making a lot of sense because it's all kind of like, oh, it all links together, you know. Yeah. And uh, and that's why um you know that's why in the West it was assimilated very quickly into culture, even whilst it remained illegal. It remained illegal. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, there was a couple of years at the end of the 60s where it was really considered, I think, it was really the symbol of the counterculture. It was, that's really what it's all about. But very quickly, people discovered it in, like, Madison Avenue in the, in the advertising places, you know, like, oh, fuck, if I smoke a spliff, I can have, like, 20 different ideas instead of just, like, three, you know? And that's advertising and marketing, you know? Which yeah. is what that's all about in New York, you know? Mad Men and all that stuff, you know, that yeah. series. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all ripped off from some quite good books about... Uh, the advertising world they were all they'd smoke weed and stuff and they're like fucking hell yeah look we could just and they make up all these crazy adverts for stuff you know? 
But in another context, that ability to give you all ideas, it's like, hang on, if we went to the palace and like blocked off that door and that door, then we can just go inside and fucking kill this cunt. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and and then they and then they do that and then get stoned when they went in there as well, because then they'd be like really spontaneous when they were fighting. You know? Yeah, it's uh, funny that because so- I did I did I, I can't I, thought, I can't remember who I was talking to actually, but there was a a study I came across to essentially provide like a neurophysical evidence of why cannabis is cre- encourages creativity and apparently i mean i'm probably butchering information but it was uh that it increases cerebral blood flow to your frontal lobe i think and i think that's where creativity resides predominantly and um, i mean it, right yeah i mean there's the physical side and then you know in just in the sort of social sciences psychology side they talk about like a flattening of associative hierarchies it sounds very complicated but it just means like different ideas that wouldn't normally be associated because they'd be considered to be on separate realms of separate levels of, of thinking yeah. suddenly they move close to each other and you make these associative leaps mm. and sometimes it's bullshit and sometimes it's not you know yeah. but um yeah it, it, i we're talking about using cannabis for work and stuff I, I think it's very good for making notes and kind of uh for, for i'm talking for writing and stuff it's very good for kind of making notes and having ideas it's not very good for like trying to string together a book in <laughs> that's funny that's funny yeah. i guess because i've got this i'm the same thing man right what i do yeah. i'm doing the animation stuff and doing all this other shit and it's one of the things i found is like first thing in the morning till about 12 o'clock pretty fresh functioning i'm on point <laughs> yeah, yeah. time it gets to be three four o'clock i'm fucking haggard man <laughs> yeah just, yeah yeah you go through this perpetual smoking and i've noticed that myself that's why that my smoking's essentially been cut down so much is that essentially if you use cannabis and it sounds so boring but it is much better utility is that if you use it as a stimulant like a coffee like if you normally have like a full bowl or a full pipe or a, or a full joint just take a toke or take two tokes and that'll be yeah, enough yeah, to yeah. activate your receptors enough to be able to receive the information without being overindulgent yeah 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 and uh yeah absolutely and then different types of, are, are really good for for that like the kind of east indian sativa stuff i'm talking about tropical yeah. stuff it's, it's really good for that and and so is the himalayan stuff because it it's a really like good um you don't burn out on it you know it's the problem with a lot of this modern hybrid stuff it's real burnout stuff you know even yeah, if it's nice in the beginning yeah you get this bleary, and you don't get that with himalayan good himalayan charis for example you, you you smoke it you go you get this lovely kind of soaring euphoria and then it just sort of evens out into this buzz that it lasts sort of, you know three hours you still got that glow of it and it's really good for doing stuff you know it's why these guys uh, were, you know, these Bahari kind of mountain guys, they'll just be wandering around. They'll do it, they'll smoke at breakfast, they'll do it, go and wander around the mountains. You know, same in Chitral in the Hindu Kush. You know, they, they have, they'll mix it in with their porridge in the morning and then walk over like three different fucking valley ranges. That sounds phenomenal. That just sounds yeah, phenomenal, yeah. man. I remember fucking sitting there, like watching this, uh, I thought it was a landslide. I'm like, fuck, what's that? And they're like, no, dude, that's just a guy who's just running back down the cliff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's the smoking. That's the guy who's telling me like, yeah, yeah, he gets like a fucking bowl of cannabis porridge every, hash yeah. porridge like every fucking morning. <laughs> it's, it's funny that though, just the simplicity of existence. It does. It does feel that way. There was, there's a quote, and it's just when you're reaching. What is it? It says before enlightenment, chop carry water and chop wood, and then after enlightenment, carry water and chop wood. You know? Yeah, Zen, Zen. That's that's Zen stuff. Yes, yeah, I mean, it's um. And and the point I think, as I would understand it, that that's trying to make is that uh, you. It's like it. Um, you, you, for example, in psychotherapy, if you're trying to fix your problems like that, you can go on talking about it for ages, kind of like we're doing now, just talking and talking. There is no limit to conversation. There's no limit to ideas. There's no limit to analyses and opinions, right? Mm. And that's all fine. But it's ultimately you've got to have a point in yourself where you're able to drop all of that stuff. In my humble opinion. You've got to have a point, a sort of center at which you just say, oh, "Fuck it, doesn't matter, just let it go." You know, yeah, yeah. Because it, it's it's you never get there's no there isn't and there I mean there are places you can get to, which are a resolution to it all, but there's ultimately not there's no limit or end to to anything. You can cut anything anything in 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 this as you're saying it goes into the fractal. Right? Yeah, it's it's infinite. You know, and it's so, almost. So, yeah, sorry, yeah. I was going to say it's almost it's almost like ironic as well because when you just the thing you're talking when you can get to. There are certain places where I mean, through meditation or, or physical you know activity or whatever that takes you oh, fuck's sake. It takes you <laughs> it to the, going on for three and a half hours, man. <laughs> three and a quarter. That's funny, man. But no, yeah. that's what I was gonna say. It was just that it's it's almost ironic because when you get to that place where where you can almost get a resolution, the further 
you get to getting a resolution on what's going on in life, the closer you get to that resolution, the further you get from being able to function in life on a daily basis. Because like, you can get so... Like, it's when, uh, there was a guy that worked at the shop, um, a place I used to stay in. He was a... Uh, he was Muslim, and and he, I would talk to him about religion in, in depth, and then it was, it was brilliant. You know, he was like maybe in his late fifties, sixties kind of thing, and mm-hmm. he was telling me about when his family first moved over here and what he was like living in Pakistan and all these different things mm-hmm. when he was a wee boy. And he said this thing to me one day, and I was like, it was quality because he just went, he went, yeah, yeah, but you've got to really be careful with this stuff. And I was like, how do you mean? And he's like, well, you can get lost. And he's just looking at me, and I and I knew what he meant. You know, just that thing where it's mm-hmm. like you, you can get lost in this stuff, and it's and it almost was just mm-hmm. like the 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 nature of interacting with daily life was the, the the precursor that led you to go what is daily life and then it gets you to that place where you're like maybe daily life da, 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 and you keep going down that rabbit hole to the point where you're you're lost and you no longer touch on daily life because you're so in, in, in well in i i would right so i mean this is the, this is the thing with that with that zen thing about you know before enlightenment you chop wood and after you chop it yeah there's there's a deeper meaning to that in the sense that it's not saying that before and after are the same it's just that the, life goes on it, it's it's not it's it's more than just that though because the buddhist and and, and, I'm, and i we can talk about this because it's all connected to the same way that the gnats and stuff and yeah. see things it, it's they're saying something deeper in the and uh, you know it's it's, it's it's in in the in the tantric context uh there is no there is no boundary between the sort of the unconditioned enlightened a groundless nature of consciousness or whatever and the ordinary mundane world but you get the what you what you mean in terms of getting lost in the world is just that you get lost in all this analysis and the particularities of it, mm. it, it by getting too attached to that and losing the sort of bigger space as it were in which it's all happening yeah so the you know and the, the, the point of all these meditation practices and stuff and 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 why the gnats would like to stay stoned all the time is that they 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 have a, a, a enough practical background because they have to go and do these ret- these sort of jungle forest retreats before they can really call themselves a gnat. You know, they have these training places, and then they'll go off and spend time meditating in the in the woods. Or they should do. They should do yeah, if, they're yeah. if, if they're respected. If they're going to be respected, and if they are respected, they'll have done that. So they do all of that because then they then they have a kind of. Uh, the 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 ability to to take all they would they would argue the ability to handle all these drugs and stuff and and take opium and cannabis and stuff and and be able to like remain in that meditative zone in which it all washes past them you know yeah. so they're in they're in the world but they're not of the world you know they're yeah. not being swept along by it it all just flows through the spacious kind of awareness that they've cultivated so they they, they don't give a fuck about if it's up or down left or right black or white it, the particularities are of no consequence because they're all empty, dreamlike, illusory displays of ultimately ephemeral stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. So they're not too worried about a final answer to it. There are states that have a finality that they learn to cultivate, mm. you know, but they're, don't, they're, but they're not, um, they have no anticipation of samsara coming to some huge conclusion, you know, because mm. by its nature it doesn't because it's infinite and it's uh, devoid of any real substance, you know, they would argue. Yeah. Uh, Muslims have a uh, the Muslim uh, Persianate Islam has a very different perspective on it. in many ways. Some of it, it has more apocalyptic tendencies, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, see, that's the conclusion. <laughs> but no, no, not 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 necessarily because it's all cyclical as well, you know. Yeah, and and they're also radically um, uh, monistic, which is kind of the thing I'm, what I'm talking about. For people who are listening, like, what the fuck is monistic? <laughs> they, this oneness, you know, yeah. in which it's all one mundane particularity and the sort of highest levels are all one they're all there's a lot of that as well so but it's um slightly different you know yeah yeah no i do honestly i find this stuff fascinating but yeah i guess we'll go out because this is going to run down five yeah. minutes <laughs> yeah. say, this has been an absolute pleasure man i'll have to come on the channel again definitely yeah i love it i love it it's really good fun and and, and thanks for like just letting me rant it's a real luxury honestly well i, I enjoy it because let's see you get a lot from it man and let's see you're doing it you're, you're you, what you do in life is unique, man. It's cool as fuck. I've no, I'd love to hear how you even fucking how you arrived at the path you're on, man. Oh, uh, it's just, I mean, uh, someone once said to me, well, you know, the, like I, there was a guy in London, uh, people from London will know, uh, Tony in King's Cross who had this cannabis cafe. I think it might still be there, but he used to, I used to go in there and say, Look, if you bring me cannabis seeds, 
uh, I'll give you weed and hash and stuff. And, and and every time I come in and say, you're fucking nuts. You realize these are like way more valuable than the hash I'm giving you. I'm like, you're nuts. You're giving me hash for these useless seeds. Eventually, I kind of tweaked he had a point, you know. Yeah. And then I kept sort of seeing people were like trying to look for this old fashioned stuff. And, and I knew where to get it because I've been dicking around in these places for years, you know. Right. And that's basically as simple as that, you know. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's 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 all still there for people. I mean, you know, one reason I'm sort of talking away in my mind is that other people will, will be interested to go and do this, and I'd encourage everyone to go and do it. And there's, you know, there's other plants as well that uh, that need to be collected that 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 you know that can be done. And 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 you know, there's just loads of and there's other people have started doing the the seed thing as well. Obviously, like more and more in the last few years, as people realise the value is got as it as it all vanishes you know so for anybody listening that would have an interest in doing that kind of thing what would be your go-to quick points for like you know travel like safety wise blah blah if somebody was to be like i really want to do this how would i go about starting this kind of thing uh just be respectful of what you're saying drop all your tent judgments because you just don't really know what it is you're looking at often and i mean you know that's the rule i try to abide by until i feel i've got a handle on it there's a lot of people who go through asia tend to be quite judgmental westerners and like yeah and, uh, and just realize you don't necessarily know what you're seeing and uh, try to, and, and then, you know, just be respectful and, and um, try and meet people on their own terms. You know, those are sort of general rules I try and abide by, you know, it's like, and, and, and listen, despite having spent like three hours, more than three hours, like fucking rambling away, I do try and sometimes, oh, and sometimes succeed in listening to what other people are saying, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it, it's, uh, yeah, anyway, uh, so, you know, it's be, be receptive and open to what's going on, you know. And Excellent. I'm sure that'll be extremely valued information. Well, that's the Angus. This has been fucking dynamic, yeah. man. I look forward to the next one. Yeah, nice one, Connor. Thanks so much.